He's looking forward to this new series, is what he means, and so am I. It's in the Gospel of Mark, and so we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit." The history of the world, wrote Thomas Carlyle in 1841, is but the biography of great men. If that's true, then the most important biography of all is that of Jesus Christ. And we have that in the four Gospels of the New Testament. They give the historical account of the the Lord's life and ministry, death and resurrection. But unlike modern biographies, they don't give a lot of historical background or exhaust his childhood or the events of his life, don't analyze the Lord's personality, his inner thoughts or motivations. The Gospel writers recount only the events and teaching that contribute to the the purpose of their writing which is to present different aspects of the person and life of Jesus Christ. Yet how difficult that is when we come to this subject. How does anyone fully cover such a vast subject when the writer is finite and the subject is infinite? John admits that at the end of his gospel he states that the world itself would not contain all the books that could be written about Christ. The subject is endless. So there's not one gospel, there are four, each giving what has been described as a slender selection of Jesus' signs and deeds, each from a different perspective. They're like the several portraits that Van Dyck painted of Charles I. They are done from various points of view, some with the king on a horse in full armor, others standing in fine clothing. All are portraits of the same man, but showing different aspects of his person doing different things. And the four Gospels are like that. They're really not biographies, but portraits that give different aspects of Jesus Christ. But they all agreed all agreed on the subject. The man, Jesus Christ, is the eternal Son of God and Savior of the world. And all wrote for the same purpose, to recount the events that determine the destiny of the world and that create saving faith in us. Of the four, the Gospel of Mark was written first, probably around A.D. 55 by John Mark. His name isn't attached to the book, though he's often identified with the young man who saved himself in chapter 14 by making an embarrassing escape the night the Lord was arrested. He grew up in Jerusalem and would have witnessed the things that he recorded. But according to very early tradition, he wrote in close association with the Apostle Peter while he was in Rome. Uh, The early church historian Eusebius described Mark as Peter's interpreter 
writing accurately all that Peter remembered of the things said and done by the Lord. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels. It's a book of action and uh, vivid details. A word that Mark frequently uses is the word immediately. The, the pace of this book is fast. Its emphasis is on Christ's works rather than his words. And that suggests to many that Mark wrote his gospel for Gentiles and specifically for the Romans, the people of action. They were builders, they were conquerors. That's supported by the internal evidence of the book, such as Latin terms that, that Mark used, as well as explanations of Jewish customs. If it was written to the Jews, there'd be no need to explain their customs. And also in chapter 15, verse 21, is the mention of Rufus, who according to Romans chapter 16 and verse 13, lived in Rome. So while this gospel would have been necessary for the Jews, it seems it was directed to the Gentiles. And there was a reason for writing this book in addition to the Holy Spirit inspiring Mark and the others to give their portraits of Jesus that would encourage faith. Historical changes were happening. The eyewitnesses like the apostles were dying. False teachers were traveling about preaching a false Jesus. A true record needed to be preserved. And especially for a Roman audience, the gospel was necessary in order to defend Christ and explain about his person and the reason for his death and the fact of his resurrection. The Romans abhorred crucifixion. It was punishment reserved for the worst of criminals. It was reserved for murderers and slaves. The Roman statesman Cicero said that the very word cross should be far removed, not only from the person of a Roman citizen, but also from his thoughts, from his eyes and ears. The fact that Jesus was crucified was a scandal to them. That's illustrated from a piece of graffito that was found scratched on a wall in the city of Rome from the first century. It's the image of a crucified man with a donkey's head and a Christian kneeling before it with the inscription, Alexamenos worships his God. So Mark shows Jesus doing mighty things. He shows Jesus doing miracles, casting out demons, amazing crowds with his teaching, confounding critics in debate, attracting large crowds in preaching and predicting and prophesying the future. He records the facts in a forceful defense of Christ and an optimistic advance of the gospel. Jesus was no misfit. He is the Son of God. That's how Mark begins his gospel. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is no biography to inform and maybe inspire. It is much more. It is a gospel. It is a dedication uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ of his person and work. It is good news. That's what gospel means. And it's good news because it is about the victory that the Son of God achieved for all who believe in Him. It begins with a, a simple, straightforward sentence. But there is a lot in that first sentence about what Mark has written in these 16 chapters. Just the names, Jesus Christ, are informative. They not only identify the hero of the book... They explain him, who he is, and what he did. Jesus means the Lord saves. Christ, as I'm sure you know, is the Greek word for Messiah. It means anointed. And this anointing indicates that Jesus was chosen by God for a special task, that of saving men from judgment and bringing God's kingdom 
and he was specially equipped to do that. He is anointed by God, and he is one with God. He's God's son, his eternal son. He's the second person of the Trinity. That's good news. God, the creator, has not created this world, wound it up like some great clock and left it to run on its own. He's not left this world to itself. He's not left it in its state of ruin. God has visited this world to bring salvation. That's the gospel. Now the word gospel was not unique to the church. It was a word used in Mark's day. It was in fact a well-known term in Rome. It was associated with the emperor cult. Caesar was worshipped as a god. He had the titles son of the divine and savior of mankind. An inscription on the Ignatian Way which it was one of the main highways across the empire, honored Caesar Augustus as God, Son of God, Augustus, Savior and Builder of the city. When an heir to the throne was born, the news of the birth was called gospel, good news. So Mark was saying, here's truly good news. It's the account of the real Son of God. It's a bold claim to make to the Romans. And one made of Jesus all through the book to the end. When in chapter 15, the centurion at the cross confesses, truly, this man was the Son of God. That's the confession of a Roman. And the, the triumphant conclusion of the gospel, even as he looked at what was a scandal to him, a scandal to the Romans, the cross, the conduct of Christ there compelled him to confess that he is God's son. And all of the gospels have this in common. All four are about Jesus Christ, the son of God. So where the four differ is not in theology. It's only in the content each writer reports. And a noticeable difference between Mark and the others is where he chose to begin his gospel. Not with the Lord's birth and genealogy as Matthew and Luke did, or in eternity as John did, but with Jesus' baptism and John who baptized him. But Mark introduces John with a couple of prophecies from Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and the promise that God would send a messenger before him, that is before the Lord, and from Isaiah 40. Behold, he wrote, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The I and my of that statement represent God, and the you and your are Jesus. The messenger is John, called a voice, just a voice. It's as if to say the person isn't important. It's not a personality that was, was sent to attract the attention of others to himself, but the message, sent with a message. And John understood that. Certainly his life was important. His attitude, his appearance, even the, the place where he ministered were all part of his message. They all contributed to what he did and what he said. But his ministry wasn't about him. He was just a voice sent to give a message. But for centuries the nation had not heard a prophetic voice. Not since the last prophet, Malachi. And that had been 400 years since, prior to this. 400 years of silence. For centuries, God's people must have wondered, whose voice is that that Isaiah spoke of? Then one day, after centuries of silence, they heard it crying in the wilderness. Make ready the way of the Lord, 
make his paths straight. The prophecy was being fulfilled and people began to stream out into the wilderness from all over the land from Judea and Jerusalem in response. This is where Mark begins his gospel with John inaugurating the ministry of the Messiah and fulfilling the ancient prophecies of Malachi chapter 3 and Isaiah 40. Which means he began his account of the Lord's ministry long before it began, before the birth of Jesus, back even further into eternity and the divine counsel that drew up all of the plans that were being fulfilled and unfolding out there in the desert. What was happening out in the Judean desert was all part of this eternal plan. It was no accident. John can't be explained as an eccentric or a genius or simply a child of his time. He was sent by God. The voice that was prophesied back in the 8th century was now speaking, which meant that the great message of Isaiah 40 was being fulfilled, the message of comfort. Now that's how Isaiah 40 begins. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed. Now that's the message of salvation. That's the message of the coming of the Savior. And the need for him was vividly illustrated from the place where John preached and the people went to hear, the desert. It was a fitting location because the nation was a spiritual wilderness. What they saw out in the desert was striking. A man clothed with camel's hair, wearing a leather belt around his waist, whose diet was locusts and wild honey. If his diet seems a little strange to you, well, is it, is it any stranger than snails and uh, oysters? But some of you like that. It doesn't fit my taste, I have to say. But this diet of John was not really unusual for that place. John was a man of the desert. He dressed and ate like the Bedouins, like the desert people. He was an austere figure whose appearance showed he was detached from the world. I don't mean that John, in saying he was detached, was uh, a monk or hermit, a, a weird ascetic like some of those uh, strange desert preachers in the fourth century who lived in caves or sat on poles. John was normal. He was a real man, a, a tough, no-nonsense person who suddenly came on the scene preaching truth, preaching it boldly, preaching it clearly. In fact, his appearance resembles the prophet Elijah who dressed in the same way. So when people saw him, when they saw John, they knew this was a serious person on a prophetic mission. What they heard, though, was even more arresting than what they saw. He was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, baptism wasn't new to the Jews. The, when, when Gentiles became proselytes or converts to Judaism, they were baptized. It, it represented moral purification. It represented a break with the old life. But John was telling Jews to be baptized, and that must have been shocking. They were God's chosen people. Why did they need baptism? Why did they need cleansing? Forgiveness? Is that what they needed? Yes, that's exactly what they needed. And John was telling the Jews that. John was telling them that their sins, their unbelief had made them like the Gentiles. They needed to wake up. They needed to fulfill Isaiah 40. They needed to make paths straight in the wilderness. And that's a 
a picture of repentance. In ancient times when the king was visiting a city, the citizens would go out and clear land. They would build a new road for the king to enter on, a road that was straight and smooth. John was telling the people to do that spiritually. He was announcing the coming of the king and telling Israelites to prepare a highway in their hearts for him. They were to clear away the obstacles, the unbelief, and make straight paths in their hearts to welcome him. Well, that's repentance. It simply means a change of mind. The Old Testament equivalent to that was to turn or return. It has the idea of uh, turning back to the Lord. In fact, uh, one verse that I think illustrates that very well is Jeremiah 31, which is the chapter that promises the new covenant and the great change that will take place in Israel and the sovereign grace of God which will transform this unbelieving, rebellious people. And in verse 17 in the Hebrew text, 18 in the English text, is the statement literally, and the King James translates this more literally than the others, but literally it is, turn me and I will be turned. And that's repentance. It's really the negative of believing. In fact, in, in John's Gospel, in chapter 1 and verse 7, John's mission is described as bearing witness that men might believe. So it is, it is connected with faith. Faith and repentance go together. Faith is the positive, repentance is the negative. The person who believes does repent. And they, they submit to an act of baptism in order to show that. That's what they did in John's day. Baptism was a sign of moral and spiritual change. The description of John's baptism as a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins doesn't mean that, that water baptism in any way caused forgiveness. It is simply an outward sign of an inward reality, a spiritual moral cleansing which God's work in man accomplishes. Man does not do this in and of himself. Faith, repentance, they are gifts of God. Nevertheless, a person must respond in faith to the message that is given and confess that he or she is a sinner. And by going out into the desert, entering the Jordan River and being baptized, people were confessing their sins and were identifying with John's ministry and looking for the Messiah. And multi multitudes did. In verse 5, Mark writes that they came from all over. Came from all over, uh, wider scope than John records here. They came from Galilee, they came from all over. But he mentions those who came from Jerusalem. Now, Matthew records that some of those who came down to the Jordan were the Pharisees and Sadducees, men of Jerusalem, men of the temple, the religious leaders. John was not impressed. John was no man pleaser. He was not a preacher who tickled the ears. When he saw them, he called them snakes. And he asked, who warned you to flee the wrath to come? Well, Mark didn't record that. But it indicates just how much excitement John had caused throughout the nation that the leaders from Jerusalem would come down to examine him. In fact, the ministry of John had generated so much interest that many thought that he himself might be the Messiah. John publicly denied that. After me, he said, one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. Now, that is the sign of a true man of God. The evidence that 
John had a real sense of the divine, a real sense of the person and nature of God. Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, saw in the temple the Lord God. Actually, what he saw in the temple was the train of his robe. That's what he saw. The train of God's robe, he heard the angels call out, Holy, holy, holy. And he was compelled to confess, Woe is me, for I am ruined. What would have been his response had he looked at the person of God? Well, he couldn't have done that and survived. But just the train of his robe caused him to say, Woe is me, I'm ruined. When Jesus caused the disciples' nets to be so full of fish that they began to break, Peter said to him, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. When we get a glimpse of the Lord's greatness and purity, when we see Him as He is, we see ourselves as we really are. And it's humbling. It's humbling and encouraging. He is not like us. He is holy and mighty and He is reliable. Our vision of God, our knowledge of God affects everything about us. It affects our thinking, it affects our behavior. B.B. Warfield wrote that there is no mistake more terrible than to suppose that activity in Christian work can take the place of depth of Christian affections. I think that's a very good statement. I'm going to read it again. There is no mistake more terrible than to suppose that activity in Christian work can take the place of depth of Christian affections. That's not a statement against Christian activity. Now, that's necessary. It's just stating that the priority is with Christian affection. God is more concerned with what you love than with what you accomplish. John the Baptist had deep Christian affections, a true sense of God. He knew Him and knew that the one coming after him was infinitely greater than he was. So later, when the crowds began to leave him and follow Jesus, John explained to his puzzled disciples, he must increase, but I must decrease. That was John. That should be all of us. But it will only be us as we see him as he is in the Bible, as we know him more fully. Then we get the right perspective on self and life, and then we have the right response. We serve him, we serve others. We become selfless people. That's what characterized John. His humility, his selflessness, his, his devotion to the Lord and his mission. Now he explains his mission in verse 8, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. John's ministry was connected to Jesus' ministry, but very different from the Lord's ministry. John's baptism was ceremonial. It didn't remove sin. It didn't impart life. Water cannot wash away guilt. But it can picture the work of the one who does that, the Lord God. He alone causes spiritual washing. He alone causes purification of the heart, which the Holy Spirit administers. In the Old Testament, the work of the Holy Spirit was prophesied as part of the ministry of the Messiah. The ministry of the Messiah would take place through the anointing of the Spirit, and the Spirit's ministry would follow the accomplishment of the Messiah's ministry. In Ezekiel 36, which is another of the great texts in the Old Testament on the New Covenant, the Lord speaks of that covenant when He will sprinkle Israel with clean water and give them a new heart. Well, that is not speaking literally there. The sprinkling is the work of the Spirit of God. It's a description of the Spirit of God. And the new heart speaks of, obe uh, of an obedient person. The heart of stone is removed. The heart of flesh is put in the place of it. 
and a person becomes believing and obedient. Now, that is a promise that's given to Israel, and that is still future for the nation. But it began in part on the day of Pentecost when the Lord sent the Holy Spirit and baptized His people in Him, just as He promised He would in Acts chapter 1 and verse 5. And that's what John is speaking of. He's speaking of the, the work of the Holy Spirit and what He would do for God's people. Well, that being the case, that raises the question, what about the cross? John didn't mention it. Didn't John understand that the one coming after him must, must first become a sacrifice? Well, of course he knew that. In John chapter 1 and verse 29, he pointed to Jesus. He introduces his, his public ministry there when he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And everything in Mark's gospel is leading to that end. The Old Testament pointed to that. The Old Testament pointed to the cross in Genesis 3.15, in Psalm 22, Isaiah 52 and 53, Zechariah chapter 13, verse 7. John knew these things. John was a prophet. And it is contained in the message that he preached. It's the basis of the ministry he had of calling people to repentance. Apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That was taught to Israel in the temple every morning, every evening, and the high holy days. It was taught to Israel continually year after year, century after century. John knew that. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so he anticipated the Lord's coming and what he would do for him, what he would do for John, what he would sacrifice for him. He was humble, grateful. He was obedient. I am not even fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals, he said. <clears throat> that statement had special meaning to the Jewish crowd that heard it. One of the rabbis of that time, one of the rabbis who was a contemporary with John and Jesus, said, all services which a slave does for his master, a pupil should do for his teacher, with the exception of undoing his shoes. They didn't have to do that. Sandals got filthy on the dusty roads. So untying them was slaves' work, degrading work. And John said that he was not even worthy to perform that service for Christ. And of course, none of us is. Christ is the Son of God. He is fully God. He is the eternal Son of God. Mark wrote that in verse 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As we understand what He is, as we understand what He did in becoming a man and dying for us, we will increasingly have the attitude of John. It is the normal Christian attitude born out of deep Christian affections. The attitude of those servants in Luke chapter 17, who after doing all the things that they were commanded to do, said, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. Listen, if you and I were able to live a perfect life, we'd have nothing to boast about. It's only what we're supposed to do. We would still say, we're unworthy servants. And yet the Lord loves such unworthy servants. The Lord loves us and loves us with an infinite love and saves us and gives us eternal life and riches that moth and rust cannot destroy. He gives us exceeding abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. So I hope our time in this Second gospel produces a real depth of Christian affections.
in all of us and makes us like John the Baptist and others who live for the Lord and gladly sacrifice their lives for Him. That's, that's the goal of this study. That's the goal of all of our studies in the Word of God. So may that be the case. <clears throat> may that be the case for all of us. But if you're here without Him, if you're here without faith in Jesus Christ, believe. Flee the wrath to come. The wrath is coming. So come to Christ because He came for that purpose. He came into this world to save sinners from judgment to come. Trust in Him. And those who do, He receives. And He receives them because He took their judgment in their place. He removed the wrath to come from all who believe. So trust in Him and escape that wrath and then by God's grace live for Him. May God help all of us to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. We thank You for this second gospel. We pray that You would bless us as we study it. We pray that You would that you would change us through it, that you would make us men and women like John the Baptist who understood that he is not worthy to undo the sandals of the Savior and yet knew that by God's grace he could be a child of God, he could be a brother of Christ, he could be one of those heirs of eternal life, possessors of it. And so we too have that great blessing through your grace. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his death for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.